more than a millennium ago. Nations were rising and falling around the world, and constant warring and chaos ensued. They were turbulent times. But what was happening in Japan? What was life like back then? Nara Prefecture, located in the center of Japan. Towards the middle of the prefecture lies Asuka. Today, the location of Asuka is in Kashihara City, Takatori Town, and Asuka Village. Around 1,400 years ago, it was the political and cultural nexus of Japan and many palaces were built here. It all began with a very small village. Japan at the time was called Wakoku, or the Land of Peace, as the nation formed, it adopted culture and technology from mainland China and the Korean Peninsula. In actual fact, many women were instrumental in this period of the nation's growth. Suiko, Kogyoku, later known as Saime, and Jito. These empresses made ardent efforts to develop the nation with Asuka as its focal point. Let's take a look at these trouble-filled times. I once lived in this area. It was a turbulent era, tainted with numerous struggles for power. I was bereft at losing my son at a very young age. Even so, I had to make crucial decisions for the future of this fledgling nation. Toyura in Asuka village. Here stands Taishizan Kogenji. Within the temple precincts are the ruins of a once formidable palace. Japan's first empress, Suiko, ascended the throne during a ceremony held on this 1,400-year-old flagstone platform. Nihon Shoki, or the Chronicles of Japan, is the first official and most complete extant historical record of ancient Japan. It includes a description of the Empress Suiko. It speaks of her as being a surpassingly graceful woman. Moreover, it states that she was an intelligent woman. Aristocrats wielded tremendous power when palaces were first being built at Asuka, despite the nation being in turmoil with repeated struggles for supremacy. From this unrest rose Japan's first empress, Suiko.
one of Suiko's greatest successes in her endeavor to unite the nation was her strong advocacy of Buddhism. In the sixth century, a few years before Suiko was born, her father, Emperor Kinmei, received a gift of a gilded bronze statue of Buddha and a copy of several sutras from the ruler of the Pekche kingdom on the Korean peninsula. When he saw the Buddhist statue, he is purported to have said, The Buddha with which I was gifted from the Western nation has a most solemn appearance, one I have never seen before. Buddhist teachings reaching Japan's shores was one of the greatest moments in its history. The driving force behind the spread of the faith was Buddhist nuns. Playing a pivotal role in this dissemination was Zen Shinni, the first person in Japan to take vows at the young age of 11. To believe in Buddhism is to renounce Japan's ancient deities. The new faith's influence spread, causing dissent. The women were persecuted by those who advocated the abolition of Buddhism. <laughs> Nun Zen Shinni, who overcame this abuse, went to Pekche at 15 for ascetic training. On her return, she again committed herself to the propagation of Buddhism. Influenced by Emperor Kinmei, Suiko was also deeply moved by the Buddhist teachings and was determined to make them one of the rocks upon which to build the nation. What will lead the nation and its people to greater happiness? It is certainly not mere political or military power. I believe happiness can be achieved if people live life with peace in their hearts. When they discover the teachings that remain unseen and unopened by them, I am confident the nation will become more prosperous. Through reverence toward Buddha, his teachings and his monks and nuns, Suiko promoted the teachings and culture of Buddhism. While fulfilling her role in honoring the deities of old, she deeply revered the Buddhist teachings of the newly arrived deity. Askandera, Japan's oldest Buddhist temple. Also called Hokoji, this temple with its five-tier pagoda and three main halls was Japan's first authentic temple. Its grounds stretched 200 meters from east to west and 300 meters from north to south. Horyuji, Yakushiji, and many other temples were built soon after. The Askadera statue of Buddha was commissioned by Suiko. Her aspirations for the fledgling nation may have permeated its soft, feminine features. From the sovereign of the land of the rising sun to the sovereign of the land of the setting sun, may good health be with you. 
These lines opened the missive from Suiko, carried by diplomat Onono Imoko to the Chinese Emperor Yang in 607. It was part of Suiko and her envoy's policies. The Sui dynasty of China was the most prominent empire in Asia at the time. So Suiko considered Emperor Yang's recognition another step toward establishing her nation. After the first mission in 600, she implemented various reforms. One included the establishment of infrastructure. She inquired about the state of affairs on the continent and had the great Yoko Oji Highway built to actively adopt the latest customs and technology. Moreover, I wanted to implement a system that enabled as many talented people as possible to be involved in building the nation. It was also important for them to be harmonious and think as a nation that could stand properly on its own. Because once people gain power, they do not relinquish it. And as a consequence, many sorrowful events occur. Seeing this happen time and again, I thought it imperative to change the system. In 604, Suiko appointed Soga no Umako and her nephew, Prince Umayato, to institute a new system of ranking officials. The 12-level cap and rank system allowed for promotion based on individual talent and achievement, overturning the convention, which formally dictated that rank was determined solely on a hereditary basis. Suiko also adopted a 17-article constitution. The first article was, Harmony is to be valued. It propounded that officials and citizens work for the sake of the nation without making arbitrary decisions. Through assistance from Prince Umayato and her advisors, Empress Suiko thus continued to build a sturdy nation that could hold its own in the international arena. In 608, Onono Imoko returned, accompanied by a Chinese envoy named Pei Shiqing. The missive he brought with him carried a message from the Emperor Yang. We learn that your majesty, dwelling beyond the sea, bestows the blessings of peace on your subjects, that there is tranquility within your borders, and that the manners and customs are mild, of which we are delighted to hear. From Wakoku to Nippon. How did the Chinese envoy Pei Shiqing perceived the land of the rising sun as it strove to transform. As Nippon's first empress, Suiko endeavored to live wisely as she brought the nation together, as the following anecdote shows. Sogono Umako, who held considerable power at the time, took the opportunity to request that Suiko grant him the lands of Katsuragi, over which she had direct control. She responded, I have always granted whatever you wished. But if the imperial court loses control of Katsuragi now, History will view me as a careless ruler and you as a disloyal minister.
she remained unyielding to Sogono Umako's self-ambitions. These were her final words. There is no need to expend valuable resources on building a new mausoleum for me. Entomb me with my beloved son, Prince Takeda. That is all I request. After quelling civil unrest and building the country of her dreams, Empress Suiko died in 628 after 36 years on the throne. Ueyama Kofun stands in Kashihara, Nara Prefecture. It's a rectangular tumulus, 40 meters long from east to west and 30 meters long north to south. Inside, archaeologists found two stone coffins. Within are thought to lay Empress Huiko and her son, Prince Takeda. Looking at the path Empress Suiko walked as she astutely endured those turbulent times, we see the legacy of an exceptional empress. Oh, beautiful capital of Asuka. Oh, Nippon, comforter to many. May you live long.